else. I would say he's adept at it because he yeah, loves he, the word adept. He loves that. But I, I, I did feel like watching this that I was like at you know uh, Ruth Chris because there was so much red meat. <laughs> but that's the audience that wants it. When you're going to when you're going to CPAC, you give the red meat. But the only difference is. He's interesting and he's funny. I mean, uh, the Democrats could use some of that. Very entertaining. We think the Democrats are funnier, Greg, for different reasons. Yes. We're laughing okay. at them, not with them. Um, <laughs> he was there, obviously, to, you know, tout his accomplishments, but also to fire up the base, because it's going to be a base election, and traditionally, you know, the party uh, in power doesn't do well. Do you think he effectively, you know, created any momentum for, for the, the base? Uh, for the crowd there, absolutely. Um, in any, but in the larger context? Well, yeah, I th but he has th the three big things that he, uh, the accomplishments he's going to point to are tax reform and the economy. Yep. Um, the judges. Yep. For this crowd in particular, mm -hmm. and then, um, and then I think he would say Second Amendment protections. That's not really a proactive thing that he did. But they but love that. Those are the three things that he kept repeating. Um, and it's not so much a prospective thing, like, look at all the things we're going to do this year in 2018. That's what he said last year. Look we what we're going to do in 2017. Because there's really nothing that they're really going to be able to get done. I don't think immigration is going to get done. And I just saw John Cornyn has just put out a statement saying he does not agree with the president on raising the age of um, the weapons to 21, of getting a weapon to 21. And so you already see that peeling off in the Senate. So the prospective things aren't going to work. Right. But telling that crowd that if the Democrats win, they're going to take away the tax cuts. They're going to try to take away the judges that you have, and they're going to try to repeal the Second Amendment. Wow. So you better go out there and vote. The other thing, the only thing about this speech, and I've said this a lot, is that I feel like he could drive a news cycle better if he chose one thing to drive news on at the top of the speech, let the networks and all the reporters cover that piece, and then move on to do the rest of the speech because he, it, everything gets lost. It was like being at Ruth Chris with like five course meal, and I couldn't I couldn't eat it all. So, and the big news, I think, what you would say was the North Korea sanctions that he left to the very end. I almost think he might have even forgotten he was right. going to break the North Korea <laughs> sanction news right. because there was so much other stuff. And he also spoke to reporters before he even got to the event, and I see what you mean about diluting the message. Juan, what was the most offensive part of the speech? <laughs> Seven years to go. <laughs> oh, yes! You know, for an old man, you know, you're risking a heart attack, President. You're gonna make it? Seven make years, it? oh my God, that's what he said. Seven years to go, the CPAC audience went wild. Yeah. So this was a rally. That's what I thought it was gonna be, and I think his staff thought it was gonna be something about increasing sanctions on North Korea, as you say, he's kind of got to it at the very end, but as an afterthought, he was far more interested in, uh, to pick up on the steakhouse analogy of throwing out the chunks of red meat everywhere he turned. I was surprised that he was throwing out chunks, though, that had to do with things like Democrats abandon DACA. I'm the one who cares. Well, Wait a minute. He's the one who ended DACA and set this March deadline. Now he finds himself in a situation, the deadline's approaching, and he's got nothing, and the Democrats are willing to take a risk. I hope they're having a little more spine than they did last time when Schumer backed out on that budget deal. And then this business about locker up. Jesse, it just seems to me like, you know, what, what would you say, Greg, that's a, a 1970s hit? You know what I mean? We've, we've been through that, and he wants, they, he's still... It's his free bird. He, he, yes. Oldie but a goodie. Oh, that was That's the worst part when he read the lyrics of Classic the Classic rock. Oh, no, oh, that was a uh, snake. that was the best snake. part. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's like he's going back. He needs a Hillary. Oh, he man, needs an Obama. So because he's not, he just needs somebody to be... Well, but it's just, it's just tired. Right, but uh, Kimberly, I think every politician has a boogeyman out there, whether it's at home or abroad, that they use to score points against, and Hillary continues to be out there in the conversation. Conversation, so why not take a shot? She she's, lost. She's the boogie. Yeah. Say that again, Juan. Yeah. <laughs> she lost. Well, she, lo she lost the electoral She loses college. every I don't think day, she though. She she keeps, it's like, like Groundhog Day for her. Every day she gets up and she's reminded. No, she no, lost. you like you like Pelosi. <laughs> oh, that That'll one too. Yes. Yeah, so Hillary's like um, the boogie person. But, you can't me. say boogie right. man. I stand corrected. Right. So the boogie person. Yes. <laughs> and the, yeah, but the crowd loves it. They love it. They're like, oh, okay, lock her up. They go crazy. You know, he does his hair stuff. He like the snake pumps. That's an X. You know. So this is like classic quintessential President Trump. This is how he speaks. Every time he gets up in front of somebody, it's a rally opportunity. Yep. You know. So and he obviously did very well with the crowd there. They loved him and. Uh, he loves them back. 
So, he and he said that at the end. He said, I love you guys. Have you, you've been to CPAC, right? Uh, yeah, yeah I, did. I spoke have there like five years. Yeah. Yeah. There's one thing, too, that uh, we didn't have, I don't think we had in the montage, where he was explaining what happens after you win an election. Yeah. And how, like, yeah, you, you, you just won it. And then, like, a year later, you got it. It's really hard. I don't remember <laughs> any pr president ever saying that. Oh, my God. That was human psychology. No, that's human psychology 101. He was explaining why you lose in two years in a way that people at home understand. It's like, ah, oh, it's so much work. You already won. And I'm going like, that's the best. It's so persuasive, I think. No. You're looking at me like I'm well, from outer space. Well, because this is evidence of how little he knows politics or how little preparation he had for the job. He's never been a senator. He's never been a governor. Never been a congressman. Yeah, that's why never been a mayor. <laughs> and then he comes out and says, oh, this is really hard. Who knew healthcare could be so complicated? At least to that's, me, this is subject of ridicule. At least that's honest. <laughs> I honest. liked it when he said, oh um, when he said that we're working on policies that are good for our enemies. I didn't say enemies, but our, our opponents. And, and they don't even, they might not even realize that these policies are good for them, but mm. we're doing them anyway. I thought that was kind of effective. Yeah, it was effective. He, he had a few nice things he said about keeping his promise, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. He bragged, obviously, about he's like, you know, the only politician that's actually kept more promises than he made during the campaign. But when you look back, besides the wall, a lot of the stuff he has delivered on, and the audience really enjoyed that. They did, and because I think they feel like he's, a, you know, kind of a man of the people, even though he's, a, you know, a New York uh, billionaire. billionaire. He's relatable because the, his language, his rhetoric isn't, like, flowery. It's very, like, down to earth. Yep. It's, like, relatable to the average man and woman. Everyone, there's something for everybody there. we like, you know what, this is my guy. He's not trying to talk above me. He's not trying to talk around me. He's making me feel like, I'm here for you. We've got things in common. I'm getting it done. And so that's like a reassuring feeling. It's not like the typical politician where you go, I can't relate to that person at all. Can, right. I, can I play skunk at the garden party for just a second? Don't play. You Be yourself. No, I don't know. I, don't know. I, just, I get, can smell it from here. But didn't, I, think, I think he promised to do away with Obamacare. Well, the uh, mandate's uh, gone. Oh, yeah. I think, I think he said... The mandate is long I think he, gone. Please get out. Obamacare is so real that Scott oh Walker in Wisconsin is now even thinking about backing It's up. a real then mess. He, <laughs> then he says, oh, I think we should have infrastructure. Oh, I don't see any infrastructure spending. I, none. Oh, well, no, no, the no. The Democrats could come to hey, the table how about and you might I actually promise, get some infrastructure. How about I yes. promise to cut the deficit? The minute I get in there, we're going to cut... Oh, oh, well, at least you just wiped yeah. ISIS off oh, the map. Yeah, no, but here, no, but that here's what's interesting is that it, you know, you, it's amazing to see Democrats caring about a deficit, and Trump did that mm -hmm. to him. But the it, the thing about what Kimberly says and what Dana says and what Juan says is the the, the presentation is an old school populist mm -hmm. gets up there and he's he's telling you this is what we're gonna do. But when you pull back. The reason why none of us all go, like, we have disagreements, and all of us do, is because almost everything he does is common sense centrism. If you look at his immigration stance, he talks about enforced border, but he's also talking about 1.7 million people. He talks about guns, he's talking about practical, proactive solutions that some that might, might even, NRA, NRA might not like. Tax reform, it didn't help, it, if people think that really helped the rich, they're wrong. Can it, I add one other thing sure. that he did today? It wasn't in the spe CPAC speech, but in his press conference with Martin Turnbull. Um, he talked briefly, but it was an interesting insight into that he is getting the briefings and he understands what's happening in Syria. And he said it was disgraceful. Um, 250 innocent people that we know of were killed, targeted by Russians and Syrians. Yep. And we have a huge mess on our hands there. The one thing that I think is a little bit different, difficult to understand is, okay, so he says that, but also in the same speech or in the press conference he says you know we have degraded isis we've taken away their territory and we're out of there yep and that is not sustainable those, both of those things cannot be true so i think going forward in a second year of a presidency your foreign policy pieces get really important and, and a little bit more difficult to to deal with you know one thing Absolutely on right. that, just before we go it's kind of a serious note but there's stories now that indicate the russians were in touch with top leadership before they attacked America. It's the same guy. It's that's the pro Yeah, that, that report is, is terrible. You could tell that the president knew about it, and then he was talking mm -hmm. to us about it. All right. He was there to... It was a grave failure to prevent last week's school massacre. Yesterday, the sheriff of Broward County acknowledged his office received 23 calls about suspected murderer Nicholas Cruz going back a decade. The FBI, of course, failed to properly investigate two tips it received. And on top of it all, we've just learned the armed deputy sheriff at the school that day did not enter the building to engage the shooter. 
Instead, he stood outside as students and staff members were gunned down inside. Scott Peterson was suspended without pay and placed under investigation and then chose to resign. Here's Sheriff Israel. Scott Peterson, was he there when the shooter was still inside the building? Yes, he was. And so what should he have done? Went in, addressed the killer, killed the killer. Just how much time went by that he did not go in, that he could have gone in? Minutes, minutes. I think it was upwards. I think he remained outside for upwards of uh, four minutes. What would you say to the families? Devastated, sick to my stomach. Um, there are no words. President Trump also had words about that officer today. He's trained his whole life. There's an example. But when it came time to get in there and do something, he didn't have the courage or something happened. He heard it right at the beginning. So he certainly did a poor job. But that's a case where somebody was outside, they're trained, they didn't react properly under pressure or they were cowards. It was a real shot to the police department. Okay, so the president addressing this, obviously everybody devastated. Can you imagine the family members and, you know, of the, the, these poor students that were murdered to think, my God, you could have done something if you mm -hmm. reacted. How many lives could you have saved? What could you have done? But instead you stood and tried to protect yourself instead of trying to save others, which is your duty. There's a couple of uh, elements to this whole story that is just infuriating. And it makes me infuriated at Sheriff Israel because he said there are no words, but when he was up at that town hall, he had a lot of words for Dana Lash. There were 18 calls from people about this guy. There were nearly 40 home visits. There were two tips to the FBI. You find out that this Scott Peterson actually had warnings passed on to him about this madman before this. The FBI tip was pretty incredible, said the guy was going to explode. And then you have Sheriff Israel deflect or, or trying to get the audience at that town hall to focus on Dana Lash. Mm -hmm. And the idea, and like, it, if, if this wouldn't happen if it wasn't for, you know, guns, guns, guns. Meanwhile, if he is aware of all of this stuff. What about him? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, this guy, he, he's got to go. I mean, it, this, this is like, this is Dan, I mean, Scott Peterson, who knows what happens when, you, when this moment comes? Do you freeze? Did he freeze? But he did have prior knowledge about this and their job and for, for the police is they have to be the first one in there. They rush in so right. we can run away and he didn't right. do it. Ugh, but I know, but yet others that had no weapon yes, rushed in ROTC to try guys. to yeah. ROTC, okay, students, children rushed in to try to save others and the coach and others that were so heroic and had nothing to defend or protect themselves. It's, it's unbelievable to me. Dana? It's, it's like a, a firefighter saying, I'm not going into that burning house to try to save somebody. I'm going to hang out out here. The thing also that bothers me about that sheriff is that I, I didn't say anything at the day on the day publicly, but he was so infuriating about uh, and off-putting, thanking all of the first oh. responders, and he went through all of them. I went, and you did such a good job, and you did such good. And, they, and, and every single press conference for three days was about how great everybody else had done. In the meantime, whether they didn't know about this until recently or they were trying to cover it up, it is so devastating did, for the I mean, families. Just that point, I think it was Jake Tapper tweeted uh, some information that he they. Deli uh, like deliberately ignored yeah. the people that actually got there first. It was another county mm -hmm. of yeah. officers. There right. allegedly there was another police department that had gotten there first and had done yeah. a lot in terms of first responding. And the sheriff Israel kind of ignored that. He's a very political guy. He yep. seems to be a real operator. Uh, where you don't want that, you want more law enforcement. I've seen pictures of him smiling with Hillary, smiling with Bernie Sanders. You know, I'm not accusing him of anything, but I, I, that's not what I. You know, the, out of the sheriff, I, I, I just want a straight shooter, and I have a few words for him. He said, I have no words. How about, I'm sorry. How about, we failed. I would have liked to hear a little accepting responsibility. It was his deputy like that politician. didn't do his job. All right, well, he should go. He should go. And you know what they did? Instead, of when they found out that this guy was, you know, derelict, they just suspended him. They didn't even really fire him. You probably can't even fire someone, and now the guy retires with full benefits. But the fact that state, local, and federal agencies all failed, yeah. yet all of a sudden they want to blame the NRA, yep. makes no sense to me here. Okay, Juan? I thought he was trying to blame the FBI. Well, the FBI should accept some blame, too. And oh, they have oh, more than the sheriff. Well, let me just say, I mean, you know, it's so easy to blame someone else, but you think about it, Jesse, almost a million calls 
a million calls and they've got to pick, you know, the, the, the needle out of that haystack. That can be difficult, especially when you're dealing with laws now in Florida. Today, a lot of discussion about the so-called Baker Act, which allows you to involuntarily take somebody and commit them because you see them as a danger to themselves or a danger to others. Well, apparently, psychiatric officials had contact with this young man, but couldn't pass that threshold. Mm -hmm. And that threshold can be pretty tough. And, and I would think that conservatives would say, yeah, we don't want people just somehow bad-mouthing us or saying stuff about us and taking away either our guns or our liberty. I would think those people that evaluated him are probably feeling pretty bad about that right now. I don't know. I, I think, though, that on the guns part, I think back to Columbine, I think to Aurora, I think to the, what the president's saying today in light of what happened with the guard here in Parkland. In every case, there was an armed guard. It didn't stop anything. Okay. That's... Right. Uh, not in Aurora. That's, that's, uh, Aurora was a, a gun-free zone, but uh, I think it's going to be hard politically for liberals to watch if Donald Trump outflanks the America today. The action targets ships and companies helping the regime fund its nuclear weapons program. If the sanctions don't work, we'll have to go phase two. And phase two may be a very rough thing, may be very, very unfortunate for the world. But hopefully the sanctions will work. We have tremendous support all around the world for what we're doing. It really is a rogue nation. If we can make a deal, it'll be a great thing. And if we can't, something will have to happen. The president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, arrived in South Korea today for the close of the Winter Olympics. She says she'll use her visit to advocate for maximum pressure on the North. So, Jesse, we're turning up the heat. <laughs> They're ratcheting it up. Yes. So I, I like how the Trump administration has slowly delivered stronger and stronger sanctions without letting the North know there's a phase two, maybe there's a phase three. How many phases are there going to be the way a python kind of squeezes its prey very slowly over a period of time? Or a so, frog in a <laughs> pot of water, slowly boiled? Apropos. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the hard power. And then you have Ivanka coming with the soft power, with the glitz and the glam. Everybody loves that. And that puts a much a more... substance, too, probably. Yeah, that <laughs> took much more substance, too. But, I mean, not as substantive as the, uh, the gunships encircling the... Uh, uh, the peninsula. And, you know, I think it's a, you know, carrot and stick. Juan, one of the things interesting about the timing of the announcement is that when President, when Vice President Pence was headed to the Olympics, he made uh, some very strong worded, strongly worded speeches about North Korea and being tough. Then we knew what happened at the opening ceremony. Ivanka Trump is going for the closing ceremony. The head military intel guy from North Korea is also going to the closing ceremony. And so I think it was uh, a strategic move to put these sanctions out today as she's landing in, North, in South Korea. Well, I, I'm not sure what's going on because remember, they canceled a meeting. They thought that Pence was going to have a meeting. They canceled that meeting at the last moment. Now, there's no such prospect for Ivanka Trump. There's no such meeting scheduled. She will have, I, I think it's dinner or something with the <laughs> South Korean president yep. at his Tomorrow. residence. But the big event will be Sunday night for the closing ceremonies, and so you'll have the two of them. Now, Ms. Perino complained last time about mm. Vice President Pence's seating. Yeah, I did. Tell us why. Well, I just feel because the cut shot put the Vice President in a bad position, and I would have advocated for a different seating arrangement. Right, so the question is how <laughs> they'll be seated. Maybe they can, well, President Trump's not there, so we don't have to worry about the ball spot. But, <laughs> but, but you can understand oh, what, what they're trying hater. to hide. No, but I, 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 it, it, the cut shots don't matter all that much, and it, that's just a small little thing. But, but the question is, there, can, <laughs> they not, they're not going to talk, but it, the question is how it comes across, because I think it's a lot of symbolism that mm -hmm. she's there representing the president, very much his number one but child. When these, and these sanctions, Kimberly, must get, we must have some idea, the intelligence communities, that the, must know that North Korea hasn't tried to stop its nuclear program at all. Of course, right? So they're getting real-time intelligence on this and updates as they should. They have to monitor it very closely. So they're obviously receiving information showing that they're not in compliance and therefore these kind of actions need to be taken. But I like the fact that, look, we're being very well represented by Ivanka Trump. She's going there and I'm, the president was obviously very proud of her to represent the country. So I think that's a, that was nice. And I'm glad that he sent his daughter. I think that's symbolic. Send a strong woman over there, represent the country, and while at the same time putting the fist to North Korea. And Greg, you, you had a good point in the commercial break. It's a new Cold War tactic. This, well, it's uh, um, an old tactic for the new yeah. Cold War. We're declaring war on companies, not just the country, which is important. Now we have to 
really go after the Chinese banks, which is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, if I wanted to walk across the studio, but each step, each successive step became half the length of the previous step, I would never reach the wall. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. That's what these sanctions are. There's an endless spectrum of, of intensity, and the hope is that you never reach the wall, which is right. the war. So the point is you have, uh, we hear this is the biggest one yet, each one will always be the biggest one yet. I liked will, my Python will, analogy a lot better. Than I was that. trying. I was mad you took the Python <laughs> one uh, because I had that. I was thinking that's what the snake poem was about. <laughs> the snake poem. Anyway, that was I'm amazing. certain if we do go to war with North Korea, we will win because <laughs> have you seen how they march? They can't get very far that way. No. <laughs> it's like they're taking half a step back. Yeah, they're taking half a step back. They do. They, it's like very slow, right, Juan? Well, you, if, you're like living South, and if I'm living in South Korea or Japan, I'm thinking, yeah, you might not get hurt, but what about us? What I know, I know, us? I know. I was just <laughs> trying to make a serious topic a little lighter. Yeah, oh, that, perhaps I failed, America. Well, then we're going to keep going on uh, some serious topics. California's and President Trump's crime. You're working on it. And uh, the protection of these horrible criminals in California and, and other places, but in California, that if we ever pulled our ice out, if we ever said, hey, let California alone, let them figure it out for themselves, in two months, they'd be begging for us to come back. They would be begging. And you know what? I'm thinking about doing it. <laughs> Democrat Dianne Feinstein fired back, saying the president's obsession with California is growing more outrageous by the day. She says her uh, his attacks are, quote, patently false. Kimberly? Yeah, I mean, he, I, th I think it's kind of funny. Oh. Is that bad? Well, no, no, but what's Well, the, no, what? because, you know, he gets upset about this. If he doesn't like, because California and a lot of the politicians, they are very aggressive against him. They want to sue him about the wall and environmental uh, reasons. They're upset because they feel that they don't like his immigration policy. This is essentially the birthplace, the um, capital of sanctuary cities, right, with San Francisco and the crimes that have happened. So they're a state that's very vocal and critical about the president, his policies, um, what he's been able to to accomplish and what he is intending to accomplish, like building the wall. So because of that, they get his focus and attention. So he says things like that that perhaps are not, you know, something that you would like to hear, but I, this is his personality. This is who he is. Wow, that was interesting. You mean you, you don't totally agree? Well, I didn't say that. I'm explaining to you where no, he's no, no, coming I, from yeah, yeah. based on the relationship, which is a little bit complicated and okay. has not been quite receptive. It's not... His state. So to Chicago and Philly be on watch for Trump payback? Uh, it's possible. I, I, don't, I don't think it's an empty threat, but you could hear the anger in his voice. He's very frustrated with California. California and the Trump administration on a collision Clash. course. yeah. Uh, we're going to get a crash course in federalism if this continues. They've gone after him, as you said, on environmental, mm -hmm. on illegal immigration, on... Uh, on judges, they've been smacking. Then I think his travel ban a few times. So yeah, ninth circuit. It, it makes for, it makes for entertaining, you know, discourse. But at the same time, California has been totally mismanaged by liberals. They they've been run by liberals for decades. They're broke. Uh, there's a very high crime rate. Homeless populations out of control. A lot of dependence on the government. There, they all they have is weather, great food, and great landscapes. So to to make. California out to be this paragon of virtue. It's just not true. Uh, someone else should come in and take charge there because, I mean, if, if it keeps going the way it's going, you know, we, we might not have a lot of the beautiful parts of California anymore. But just, just a quick question. We're short on time, but Silicon Valley, Hollywood, that's not... That's amazing parts of California, oh. Juan, but not everybody lives like Hollywood and Silicon Valley. No, no, Valley. I'm just saying, that's pretty successful. I agree, their, but that's not, doesn't define the state. Pretty amazing to me. But anyway, so Dana, uh, Jerry Brown, the current governor of California, signed a California Values Act that forbids local authorities from asking about immigration status. This was back in December. Mm -hmm. So it would seem like he won't, that the president is putting it to Jerry Brown. T I'm going to take away your ICE agents or you undo that law. Right, and so even if the president is uh, just spitballing ideas, um, it, he's later told by his chief counsel, actually, sir, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, it doesn't necessarily matter because from a communication standpoint, he is trying to make his case. And so he can constantly go back and say, I would have taken them out of there. They deserved it, but I got to keep them in. So you know, it becomes a rhetorical device in a way, but it does send a pretty strong message, and other states will probably take a second look and want to back away from the hot stove. 
So we got two California people on this panel. One of them is Greg Gutfeld. That's correct. Thank you, Juan, for noticing that. This is obviously sales tactic. You know, every option's on the table. We've seen this before. Remember when he asked, why can't we use nukes? Remember that? Right. What's, what's the problem with using nukes? <laughs> right. And why can't we build a wall? Is that true? Well, like, no, but this what? is what he really said. Oh, but wow, wow. As a, I'm, you brought well, up California. As a Californian, it's depressing to me because I loved growing up there. It was the best. Probably the best time to live in California was during the 70s. It was fantastic. You, you know, it was just, you were, it was, it was great. It was cheap. Now it's not. I can't live there. But now it's in a crappy. Yeah, you can't afford it. New York it. is really an expensive. <laughs> yes, exactly. Move to a cheaper place. California is in a crappy situation, literally. San Francisco, I believe, spent something like $30 million cleaning up homeless feces All right. and syringes. That and wasn't it, like that when I was first there. Exactly. Here's the thing. Did you ever watch that show called My 600-Pound Life? It's about really life that's what, or life. life. Oh. <laughs> California is that person. It's too big to oh, move, yeah. so everyone oh. else is moving. Everyone's Jesse. leaving because. And by the way, you did bring up Silicon Valley and Hollywood. You're talking about the ultimate example in economic inequality. <laughs> Stockton right now is going to enact a universal base income because people they can't they don't know how to deal. Facebook Friday. It really is fantastic.